One of the things about mazes is that they for force us to make choices, you know, right or left, forward or back. And as we explore uh, this landscape of religion and spirituality in the world, we hear a lot of conflicting advice from countless sources. And so we ask ourselves, whom should I trust? I mean, could there be a more practical question for life? Whom do we trust? Now, so far in our, our series, I've shared two, uh, two key theological questions to begin sorting through all the options that are out there. And the first one is simply, does God exist? And along with that, what is, what is he like? And then the second that we introduced last week was, who is Jesus? Uh, so last time, uh, of course, we heard from a Jewish rabbi who, in rather an indirect way, answered that he considered Jesus to be a, a blasphemous false prophet. Uh, well, today, uh, we'll hear from an Islamic imam who, whose answer to that question actually may surprise you. Uh, you know, when tensions rise and tempers flare, uh, people sometimes settle disputes with their fists. And, uh, and that happened, I have to admit, it happened to me once. It, it was on the playground of Monta Vista Elementary School, and I was in the fourth grade. And I spent most of my time with a very painfully awkward group of nerdy kids. And this bully was making fun of one of my friends, and so I spoke up for him. And so the guy challenged me behind the cafeteria after school into how could I back down? I felt like I had to go through with it. And so the whole afternoon, I was worried until the final bell rang at the end of the day. And uh, I, one of my friends went with me, and I showed up. And the other guy showed up with his friend. And we, we circled each other for a minute, and trading insults and staring each other down in a fourth grade sort of way. And, and then he charged at me with his fists raised above his head with this kind of weird chopping motion. And I just sort of stepped out of the way, and he fell down. And, um, and there were a few more heated words exchanged after that, and then we just went our separate ways. That was it. Of course, the next day, you know, the accounts of what happened were very different. Uh, and so again, who, who are you to trust? Uh, but strangely enough, now I'm friends with him on Facebook, and we seem to share a lot of the same interests. So unfortunately, uh, most fights in history don't have that sort of ending, right? I mean, they often, they often, honestly, they often start the same way, a sort of playground posturing and people trying to intimidate one another, but things often escalate. Uh, personal offenses then kind of combine with economic and political aspirations, and sometimes religion is then enlisted as support, as validation even. Uh, the most obvious example of, of that kind of religious warfare is, is found in the Crusades during the Middle Ages. In the 7th century, an Arab empire began to spread from the Middle East, west into North Africa, and east into Asia. And, you know, there were a variety of political factors uh, involved, but that new, uh, that, that movement was uh, at least accompanied, if not propelled by, uh, a, a religious movement known as Islam. And so uh, Western Europe uh, responded, like I say, for a variety of political and economic reasons, but the rally cry raised by Pope Urban II in 1096 was to reclaim the Holy Land in the name of Christ. So over two centuries then that followed, there were eight major crusades. Tens of thousands of people were killed, including many innocent ones who, who got caught in the middle of this thing. Countless atrocities were committed. And yet, people still claimed some sort of spiritual justification for it. Now, that whole background certainly hasn't helped Christians and Muslims understand each other's theological views. Because uh, we look at each other with mutual suspicion. And once you consider someone an enemy, it's very hard to keep from painting them in the most negative light. And so that conflict just continues to, to simmer, and, and at times it, it boils over like it, it, it did 
on the terrorist attacks of 9-11 and then the subsequent military response from the United States. Uh, and so that whole tense time period in history serves as the backdrop for the story of Hafiz Naman Akbar. He came to Kalamazoo from Pakistan to study engineering at Western Michigan University, but he ended up becoming the imam at the Kalamazoo Islamic Center. And he also teaches in the university's uh, comparative religions department. So it's a very knowledgeable man. I met with him a few weeks ago, and here's what he told me about his own personal story. The moment that I've not, not forgotten, you know, that's 17 years ago. In a classroom, a professor was teaching, it's a sociology class, and we were reading, we had three books, textbooks. One, one was a book of journals, and one of the journals we had to read about Muslims in sociology was saying 70, 80 percent of the Muslims that go to an Islamic center are terrorists. That was very awful. So I, that was my moment. I said, okay, I'm going to most likely either fail this course or drop. Something's going to happen. So I raised my hand. It was a class, big, those, you know, Western had those mega classes where like 100 students were sitting. I raised my hand. I said, professor, this is wrong. I want to tell you, I go to a mosque. And I'm not a priest or an imam or a preacher. I go and pray there. I don't see any bad people there. And I see people of color, actually black, white, yellow, Asian, from every background, right on campus. So he said, you know, uh, professor asked me to give a speech, uh, like uh, misconceptions about Islam, that things I've found in the textbook. I said, you me? I said, yes. So see, that was my moment. I said, oh, like, I think I can teach. So that's when, even at the center, I started getting involved more. And actually, many activities like this one, the interaction, knowing, getting to know one another, increased. We had professors who used to bring their classes just to show people a mosque, like this is how a mosque looks like, not it's how it was being portrayed in the media at that time. Media was like literally, you know, when there's a war going on, media has a certain trend. So we were the bad, negative trend. So this was my moment, and uh, that's when a lot of people here, they encouraged me to, not just about teaching others, they said, we want you to teach our community. So what are the actual beliefs of, of Islam then? According to a 2016 study from the Pew Research Center, it's the world's second largest religion. It claims 24% of the world's population, so it, and it reaches far beyond the Middle East, and the largest concentrations of Muslims today are actually in Asian countries like uh, Indonesia and Pakistan. So we should know something about it, but again, whom should we trust? I mean, part of the, the whole point of this series is to go beyond the stereotypes, to understand the complexity of, of the religious landscape by talking with individuals. So I want to share uh, excerpts from my conversation uh, with Hafiz uh, Naman Akbar. And, and of course, the whole interview is available uh, on, uh, online. But um, I want to focus on four foundational Islamic beliefs, their view of scripture, their view of God, their view of Jesus, and their understanding of salvation. And so to start with, with scripture, um, you know, the city of Mecca in modern-day Saudi Arabia plays a major role in the story of Islam. The area is this, the site of the Kaaba, it's this cube considered to be the, the first house of worship ever built for God. In fact, uh, Muslims face Mecca when they pray, uh, and they claim that Abraham uh, and his son Ishmael worshipped there. But the area was also the site of a mysterious revelation that was accepted as Islam's scripture. It's called the Quran. So the imam explains that background for us. Now, sources of Islam guidance, primary fundamental source is the book that came to the teacher of Islam, not a founder. He said, I'm a reviver of the faith. He came among the Ishmaeli people, the Ishmaeli tribe that settled throughout Arabia. Uh, Ishmael uh, ha also has 12 sons, and they spread through Arabia. So all Arabia is actually descendants of Ishmael, all the way to Yemen, you know, the Arabian desert. We're not talking about Palestine. We talk about actual Arab peninsula. Mm -hmm. So this land, this is where from the same family, 
uh, among their descendants, a man named Muhammad, the prophet, was born in the 7th century, late 6th century, early 7th century. And he revived, so Arabia became pagan. So he revived monotheism, Abrahamic monotheism, back to its roots. So exactly as Ten Commandments were speaking, exactly as God spoke to Moses, exactly as God spoke to the prophets of the Bible, um, and even other nations, wherever God has spoken to people, wherever there is a message of oneness, Prophet Muhammad said this is a good message to take. They asked him, the old prophet of God, so your source of guidance that God gave you is Quran. So this is all understanding Islam. So you see, it's Quran. Quran is a revelation, like gospel to Jesus, or Torah to Moses, peace be upon them, the uh, graces of God be upon every one of his chosen people. So they said, what about previous messages? So yes, Quran is your teaching. And then his own wisdom. He was teaching people with Quran and his teachings. It's called Hadith. These are the two fundamental sources. So the name Quran means recitation. It's, it's said that sometime around a 610, or AD 610, while Muhammad was alone in a cave outside Mecca, the angel Gabriel uh, appeared to him and began to dictate the Quran uh, word for word. And then as he shared those revelations with others, they decided to cleanse the Kaaba from, uh, from idols and devote it to the worship of God. And so today, more than two million Muslims a year visit the Kaaba on pilgrimage. Uh, Muhammad continued to receive those revelations and then his followers memorized them and wrote them down. So Muslims treat the Quran with uh, this mysterious revelation uh, with the utmost reverence. Now, that leads us then, uh, you know, as you, as an outsider, as you, one of the things you quickly notice about Islam is its use of beautiful calligraphy. I mean, we even see it, for example, on the, the green flag of Saudi Arabia. The words displayed on the flag are known as the Shahada. It's the fundamental confession of Islam. Uh, it roughly translates into something as, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. Uh, so their art is an expression of their theology. They worship God as a transcendent master who must not be portrayed by idolatrous images. The idea is that only words will do. And so the imam described Islam's view of God by comparing it with the art displayed by some branches of Christianity. Here's what he said. In the Old Testament, there are these uh, sort of graphical depictions of God, almost like a person, you know, wrestling with, for instance, right. David or yeah, Jacob. The who, angel of God appearing. Yeah, or... yeah. yeah. In, in, a, in a, especially God. So those manly or human depictions of God are not allowed in Islam. God is above a canvas. You know, God is above, you know how sometimes when we go to a, especially in a Catholic church, there is a picture of a very, very old person, big white beard, very Muslim looking, and he's doing this, <laughs> <laughs> right? He's doing this. And then there's the whole humanity coming through his hand. Uh, even though I know it's not literal, the, the, the person who drew it did not mean it literal, or, you know, Michelangelo doing his statue and this and that. Islam forbids all of that. It's actually taking Ten Commandments seriously. Let's not draw images of God. God is above and beyond that. Because when I draw an image of God, and I'm sure Protestant world agrees to that because this was part of the Protestant movement, that God, if I draw him, on a canvas, I am limiting God. You know, yes, with a white beard and old age, it, it shows wisdom, but it does not show the strength and power. So you see, there will always be a give and take. I will lose something. So this is a major fundamental key difference, creed and practice wise on divinity of God. So how then does someone relate to the powerful transcendent God of, of Islam? Well, the imam made that point clear from the very outset of our conversation. Here's what he said. Islam literally means submission to the will of one God. So 
just by the name, Islam means sub submission to one God or accepting God as your guide, as your ultimate source of guidance, inward, outward. Uh, it's a monotheistic religion. So with this transcendent view of God, you might assume that Islam would simply reject Jesus as Judaism does. But instead, it views him as an honored prophet. I mean, how is that possible? Well, I think we need to understand a little bit about Islam's historical setting. Because if you look beyond Arabia uh, to the north during the time of, of Muhammad, uh, you find that from its humble beginnings, Christianity had spread throughout the Roman Empire. In the fourth century, uh, Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity and declared himself to be a Christian. And so Christianity becomes linked to the empire and its power. Uh, but there was a problem. Christians were divided over how to explain the humanity and deity of Christ. And so to maintain unity in the empire, Constantine called the first ecumenical church council at Nicaea in uh, 325. And there were six similar councils that followed over the next four centuries. And I'll say more about those next time uh, as we talk about the Eastern Orthodox Church. But focusing on Islam at this point, we find that the Quran actually addresses those debates in a way. Uh, the Imam told me this. However, Islam has a very unique view on Jesus Christ. We are mentioning the name Christ. One of them is that Jesus is born through a virgin birth. No question about that. Two, Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ, not only him, his mother, uh, Mary, peace be upon her, is one of the most honorable women ever, ever existed in uh, creation. Two, and she, she and Jesus Christ are mentioned more than her alone. She, so Mary is mentioned 19 times in the Bible. Jesus Christ is mentioned more than 34, 35. Uh, Mary is actually mentioned more than 34, 35 times in the, Bible, in the Quran. Highly honored, revered. And Jesus Christ is the same way. More mentioned by name than Muhammad. So, but, now coming to the miracles. All the miracles of Jesus Christ are accepted, and in fact, if anyone denies those miracles, is not considered a Muslim. And in fact, people who criticize Jesus, you know, Quran condemned them. Quran said, don't say that you killed Jesus. Don't say that you uh, humiliated Jesus. God saved him from all the humiliation. And here is the difference. Quran, at the same time, so honoring and uplifting his status, including mother's status, like, she is the chosen one of all the women of mankind and jinn kind and humankind in creation ever, but he's not divine. So Muslims not only deny that Jesus is God, they say that he did not suffer the humiliation in death of the cross. And the idea is that they cannot accept that something like that could happen to one of God's prophets, holy prophets. And so they believe that the, that the Quran was given in part to correct Christianity's teaching about Jesus. Now, Islam has a very strong set of standards regarding diet and morality, family relationships. And so Muslims also have this very strong cultural sense of honor and shame. Righteousness is expressed in deeds like uh, fasting and giving alms and praying. In fact, they pray five times a day on, on, a, on a set schedule. And so if you're near a mosque at the right moment, you'll, you'll hear the, the call to prayer. A uh, person's deeds are important because Islam teaches that God will, will judge every person and bringing a balance to the scales of justice for eternity. And so those who have been obedient will enter paradise, receiving the reward they've earned. But what about others? The Imam gave me this explanation. There are some worldviews where no matter what a person does, no problem. It's like heaven is reserved. Mm -hmm. Islam doesn't have that. In fact, Islam does not guarantee, promise uh, paradise to people just because I'm a Muslim. 
Islam requires practice. So in the hereafter, I could have, uh, that, by, by the way, hereafter is the real life. This life is short, no matter how long I live, I, even hundred, one day I will be done. One day death is coming. It's inevitable truth, bitter truth that people don't want to admit, but this is what this life is. So there must be a place because today in this world, a lot of good people die unnoticed, unheard, unappreciated. A lot of bad people die with no justice, uh, without getting caught, uncaught, untouched. There has to be a place, a courtroom where people will go and the judge will say, see this man, nobody knew, here is the reward for this guy, and he will live for eternal bliss there. Here is this guy, he killed, but he killed by accident, he, uh, or he punched somebody in the face, he didn't mean to punch him that bad, but he ended up taking his eye out, so he goes to jail for a week. Nobody caught him. I'm gonna give him ultimate justice. He goes to jail for a week. That's temporary hell. And here comes a guy who murdered like Hitler. Suppose, you know, as the world told us, I was not there when Hitler was <laughs> around. Bad guy. God says, you Hitler, not just you, you have that advisor with you, that you and you four, you go to hell for eternity and you go into the midst of the lowest and the lowest of the hell. Right? Nobody caught them. So there has to be that courtroom. Of course, Christianity addresses all the same topics. And there are significant differences with Islam at each point. Next time, we'll begin to examine those various branches and denominations of Christianity. Um, there's a lot to explore there. But for now, let me explain the foundational beliefs that are generally shared by all Christians. And each one really relates back to the question, whom should I trust? First of all, we consider our view of Scripture. And I use the word verif or the phrase verifiable testimonies. You know how in a courtroom, the testimony of one witness is not sufficient to verify a claim. Right? We seek multiple witnesses and corroborating evidence. In the same way, the Bible, Christianity's Scripture, is not a direct revelation dictated word for word to one, in, one single individual. Right? It contains various books that were written by uh, at least 40 different authors over a span of 1,500 years. And I think it's important to note that much of the Bible contains or records verifiable testimonies of public events. What I mean by that is that other witnesses could have disputed the accuracy of those accounts when they were written. Now, there are also sections in the Bible, of course, of, of poetry and prophecy and, and teaching, but those are still anchored uh, in those public events, things like the appearance of the glory of God on Mount Sinai before all the people of Israel. And that testimonial character of the Bible is particularly evident as we come to the New Testament Gospels, right? They record for us the life, teaching, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we have four separate accounts from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they all tell us some of the same stories, right? But, uh, but they also highlight different details from those stories, and they each contain unique stories. Uh, we know Matthew and John were apostles of Jesus. Mark may have, so, so they witnessed his life firsthand. Mark may have personally witnessed some of the events, particularly the, the last week of Jesus' life before the cross. But many think that his gospel contains the, the recollections of the apostle Peter. But when you come to Luke's gospel, Luke was not an eyewitness. So he begins his gospel by describing his approach to writing. And I think it's really instructive. He says in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, And as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also having followed all things closely for some time now, sometimes past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So on one hand, this, the Bible is a human book. 
But what is it that gives it divine authority? Well, we believe that God worked through uh, those authors uh, as they wrote. Uh, each of their books show indications of their own personality and their logic as they write. But the end product carries God's authority. And Peter describes something of that process in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. He says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, much more can be said about the trustworthiness of the Bible. But these passages are a good starting point to understand it. The Bible is based on verifiable testimonies. Now, next... Christianity understands God to be a loving Father. Now, that doesn't minimize His, his holiness or His transcendence. Instead, it, it expresses His deep concern and His compassion for us. He's not distant, cold, or aloof. He's, he's perfectly loving. And so, though submission is certainly a part of our relationship with Him, those who believe in Jesus are spiritually born again so that we can relate to him as, as dependent, loving children. Now, Jesus proclaims that understanding of God even in his Sermon on the Mount. He, he talks about God as our heavenly Father whom we can be confident in because he hears our prayers and he watches over us. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 9, it says, Jesus says, when you pray... Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And and then, of course, he, he shares what we call the Lord's Prayer. So we're supposed to relate to God as a Father. And for, for Jesus Himself, the fatherhood of God expresses something even deeper. Right? Because he claims to be the Son of God. But he didn't mean by that that he was, in any sense, God's offspring. Uh, and I think that was understood at the time. When you read uh, John chapter 5, verse 18 says that the Jews were seeking to kill him because by calling God his Father, he was making himself equal to God. That's a, that's a key idea. John then records several statements that Jesus makes on the subject and John 5, and 23 stands out to me. It tells us that Jesus says, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So that's why this second question, who is Jesus, is so important. Because from a Christian perspective, it's not enough to just be a spiritual person. It's not enough to acknowledge that there's only one God or even to try to obey him. According to this passage and others in the New Testament, you you cannot honor God without also honoring Jesus as his son. Now that leads to, uh, again, talking more about our view of Jesus. We need to see that the Jesus of Christianity is a suffering Savior. I mean, think about it. From a worldly perspective, he was born in obscurity and raised in in poverty. He was considered to be a friend of tax collectors and sinners. His closest followers weren't powerful princes, but lowly fishermen. And so rather than demanding submission, Mark 10.45 tells us that he said this, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As he reflected on the life of Jesus, the Apostle Paul summed up his first coming in Philippians 2, 6 through 8, with these words. He said, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. On one hand, you could say, well, why would God the Father allow his son to experience something so terrible? Well, it's because 
our attempts at submission and obedience have failed. Right? That, that we're all sinners who deserve condemnation. And so the cross was the only way for God to show his loving mercy and grace, saving grace, while still upholding his perfect holiness and absolute justice. Paul talks about that in Galatians 3, 13 through 14. Here's what he says. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Now, of course, that curse doesn't remain hanging over Jesus or attached to him in any way. He satisfied God's justice on the cross, and then he rose from the dead in triumph. He ascended into heaven, and one day he will return to be exalted on earth. And so Christianity teaches that salvation is a divine gift, that we cannot earn our way into eternal life, that, that we're sinful people and that no matter how hard we try, we, we still do things that God forbids, and, and we fail to do the things He commands. We're just not consistently thankful or loving or worshipful. And each of those sins infinitely offends God's holiness. So in Romans 6.23, Paul wrote, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And how does someone receive that gift? Well, John 3, 16 tells us, right? Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So as we map out the religious maze, uh, we see a clear divide between Islam and Christianity. On one hand, the, the Quran is a mysterious revelation to one man. But the Bible is grounded in verifiable testimonies from many different people. Islam calls us to submit to God as, as a transcendent master, but Christianity invites us to place our confidence in a loving, heavenly Father. Islam honors Jesus as, as one of God's prophets, but Christianity sees him as the Son of God who became human and suffered a humiliating death to save us. And so Islam teaches salvation as a reward earned through obedience, but Christianity proclaims that it's a divine gift received by faith in Christ. So we come back to that question, right? Who, whom will you try? Which teaching? Are you trusting in Jesus? Are you ready to begin if you're not already? I think one of the challenges is that for some people, Christianity just sounds too easy. And we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. But if you'd like to learn more about Christianity, we quoted from John 3 there at the end. That's a great chapter to read to learn about uh, this, uh, the Christian life and faith. And if you're a Christian, I would ask this. What is your view of God? How do you relate to him? I mean, do you, do you relate to him like a slave to a master? Or do you see him as your loving heavenly father? I mean, he, he watches over us and cares for us. And no matter how crazy the world seems, uh, he's there for us so that we can pray to him and that we can find confidence in him. As you seek to grow in your faith, I'd encourage you to share that journey with others. I mean, this is a tumultuous, these are tumultuous times. So it might be a great question to ask someone whom they trust and see where the conversation goes. May we grow in our understanding of the love and grace of God.